The song has been covered about 50 times by everyone from Cher to Kylie Minogue. It's been on Glee. It was one of the numbers of the musical based on ABBA's music, Mamma Mia. It's a dance pop tune that has lasted the test of time. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the song Dancing Queen, and today we will be doing a deep dive into the song to talk about its history, its influences, the impact on pop culture, a few other weird and wonderful facts that you probably don't know, and at the end of the video, I'll hook you guys up with some pretty sweet ABBA memes. So get ready, hit subscribe, ding that bell, and strap yourself in. Dancing Queen At face value, it's a song about a teenage girl at a discotheque, but in actual fact, it is so much more. The titular dancing queen in the song might be looking for love, but the song lyrics seem to imply that, in fact, she just wants an excuse to put on her dancing shoes and shake her booty on the dance floor without the sturm and drong of romantic entanglement. Sure, men flirt with her, but as the words state, you're a teaser. You turn them on, leave them burning, and then you're gone. Let's face it, she's most likely jailbait for a lot of these older pervs looking for a chance to score with a hot teen in a discotheque they're out of her league. In fact, I'm not sure how she got into a discotheque underage. What's up with that? She must have had some pretty convincing fake ID. Maybe she found that excellent article on WikiHow. That article saved my life when I was a teeny bopper. But who cares? It's a pop song. A perfect pop song. The lyrics state that she's looking for a king, but as the song evolves, you realize that she's there to dance, to jive, and to have the time of her life. The Dancing Queen doesn't need a king. She just needs a dance floor and some non-slippery dance shoes. High performance on trend dance sneakers could do the trick. Then again, they're pretty fugly. Ballet slippers are, well, they're just not appropriate. I doubt she's going to be doing pirouettes. No black swan action for this chick. I can only imagine something with a shock-absorbing heel cushion and decent arch support. In the 1970s, a lot of big acts were expected to churn out an album a year. This was no exception for Swedish powerhouse ABBA. They were ready for the hard work. They were ready for the fame, drugs, and groupies. The only problem is, they didn't do drugs, and, well, ABBA consisted of two couples, so I'm not sure how many groupies there were, but you catch my drift. Hot off the heels of their Swedish summer tour supporting their self-titled album, they headed straight into the studio to start working on new songs. Itchy mustache. Uh. Dancing Queen, arguably the world's first Europop disco hit, was originally titled Boogaloo. The title was a reference to the disco rhythm of the song, which was partly inspired by the rhythm of George McRae's Rock Your Baby. Rock Your Baby was one of the first hits of the disco era in 1974, selling 11 million copies. In fact, McRae wasn't even intending on becoming a disco king. He was planning on becoming a cop, but Casey and the Sunshine Band invited him to sing the high notes in one of their songs. They initially invited his wife, but she was unavailable and George had a kick-ass falsetto. Rock Your Baby soon followed along with Fame and Fortune. The title, Dancing Queen, was the brainchild of ABBA's manager, Mr. Steak Anderson. The drumming in the song was inspired by Dr. John's album, Gumbo. Who is Dr. John, you may ask? First off, he's not an actual physician, silly pants. Dr. John was an eccentric R&B, blues, and pop rock artist from New Orleans. Fun fact, the album cover of Gumbo was taken in front of a mural in New Orleans adorning the wall of the Farmer John Company. I'm not sure if Farmer John and Dr. John were friends, but they should have been. They're both Johns. Just like I should be friends with every Stephen on the planet. Just because why not? This mural also ended up in Brian De Palma's classic horror movie, Carrie, which was a fucking awesome movie. Seriously, guys, De Palma is the shit. Some say he's a Hitchcock clone, but I don't care, man. I love his films. He did Scarface for Pete's sake. Who doesn't love Scarface? The last person who told me he didn't like Scarface died. Oh, from heart failure. I had nothing to do with it. Come on. Come on! The melody of Dancing Queen was heavily reminiscent of Sing My Way Home by Delaney and Bonnie. Now, Delaney and Bonnie had an interesting career trajectory. They only lasted from 69 to 72, but in those few short years, they both became cokeheads and fought all the time. Ah, the perils of fame. Their album, Country Life, was rejected by the record label on grounds of poor quality, and they split up. Interesting side note, Bonnie had allegedly taught George Harrison how to play slide guitar. When the backing tracks of Dancing Queen were finished, drums, guitar, bass, and keyboards, Benny Anderson brought a tape home to Annie Fried Lingstad, also known as Frida, 
and she was so struck by the beauty of the song that she cried. In a later interview, she says, And he came home with a tape and played it for me. I started to cry. As with pretty much all of Abba's songs, the lyrics were composed after the music was recorded. In September 1975, a month after they initially started writing the song, Frida and Agnetta recorded their vocals. It was also the only time they filmed in the recording studio. Perhaps it's because, as Agnetta said, they all knew that Dancing Queen would be a massive hit. It's often difficult to know what will be a hit. The exception was Dancing Queen. We all knew it was going to be massive. And massive it was. It was a number one hit in at least a dozen countries. The initial first verse was thrown out and replaced because, well, it sucked giant donkey balls. Baby, baby, you're out of sight. You're looking all right tonight. When you come to the party, listen to the guys. They've got the look in their eyes. Fucking perverts. She's a teenager. Come on. Now the lyrics weren't terrible, but Friday Night and the Lights Are Low is such a perfect pop song beginning. Friday, the nighttime, moody lighting. It sets the stage in a strong visual way, unlike Baby Baby You're Out of Sight, which, to be honest, kind of sounds like a line from a homeless Justin Bieber. It took the gang three months to record. They ended up debuting the song a few times in public before its actual release on August 15, 1976, one full year after they began writing it. They recorded Fernando and Dancing Queen in the same time period, but decided to release Fernando first. Their previous single was Mamma Mia, and they thought a ballad would be a better follow-up to a smash dance hit. It's all about dynamics and strategy, my friends. It's all about dynamics and strategy. Now, the first public performance of the song was in January 1976 for a TV special in Germany. The video was a hoot, complete with synchronized dance moves and epilepsy-inducing flashing lights. The dancing doesn't seem completely polished, but it's charming nonetheless. You also get a feel for their different dance styles. Frida uses a lot more hip and hand movements and seems more expressive. Agneta is smooth but cautious with her movements, like a cat. Bjorn seems happy as a clam. Benny is, well, Benny. No matter how much you like or dislike the dancing, you have to admit, it's a far cry from Theresa May. They performed the song again in March 1976 in Australia. They were already huge down under. This time, Benny stands up while playing the piano and they all have shiny blue suits. The girls seem to have abandoned their synchronized dance moves. There's also two guys on guitars and drummer behind them. Unlike the band, they wear white t-shirts and dark pants. One of the guys has a perv mustache, otherwise known as a perv sash. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Hashtag perv stash. Benny is way more expressive on the piano. On June 18, 1976, two months before the official single release, they played the song during a gala at the Royal Swedish Opera in honor of King Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden and his bride-to-be, Sylvia Summerlath, who were married the next day. A song about a queen was played for a queen. Nice. I see what you did there, Abba. The band also dressed in Baroque outfits, the synchronized dancing was much more subdued, and Benny was sitting down again. Frida sang it solo in 1983 for Queen Sylvia's 50th birthday. It's actually a pretty interesting version with the a cappella group The Real Group singing backup. Frida looks much more modest and less flashy, although her dress is humongous. As I said, the song was enormous. It was their first and only number one hit in the United States. It topped the charts in over a dozen countries. It was number one for 14 weeks in Sweden, and it's the sixth most played song in Britain over the last 70 years. According to Donald A. Guarisco of All Music, the track's sincerity and sheer musicality have allowed it to outlast the disco boom and become a standard of dance pop. This is true. You can't go out for another town without hearing it. Somewhere. Somehow. Even if it's just blasting from some dude's yellow Lamborghini speakers. Now the funny thing about fame is that there's a downside. Check out this interview in which Frida talks about the loneliness of being in a massively successful band. The loneliness uh, being in a, a very famous group like that. You know, you when we toured, for example, we could never go outside the hotels. We could never enjoy actually places where we went to. We had to stay locked in, in the, at the hotels, and uh, it was a kind of secluded, very strange life in a way. Standing at 101 beats per minute, Dancing Queen has been discovered to be the best music to walk to at a brisk pace. It's been suggested that 100 steps a minute is the ideal walking pace. 
So if you walk at this pace for 30 minutes a day, you reduce body fat, lower blood pressure, thereby sharpening your memory and thinking skills. Walking at this pace also improves the flow of blood, glucose, Gluclo glucose, glucose, and other nutrients. In other words, Dancing Queen promotes good health. Not to mention, dancing is an excellent cardiovascular activity. According to Chris Evans, who apparently hung out with the Queen, it is the Queen's favorite song. Evans claimed that at 93 years old, she got up and cut the rug when the song came on, stating, I'm the Queen and I like to dance. Activist Vivian Westwood has been known to play Dancing Queen while she protests fracking and breakdancing while doing it. So she's a breakdancer. She's a breakdancing activist who loves ABBA. Who would have thunk? MGMT used the exact same tempo for their song Time to Pretend. So if you go out walking, bring Time to Pretend and Dancing Queen and you'll shed the fat in no time. Chris Stein tried and failed to replicate the song with Blondie's song Dreaming. Don't get me wrong, Dreaming is a good song and Blondie is a goddess, but it ain't no dancing queen. Sorry, Chris. Back to the drawing board. Elvis Costello was inspired by the descending octave piano chords which he threw into his song Oliver's Army. As William Faulkner said, immature artists copy, great artists steal. There is something both exuberant and youthful and yet melancholy about the song. It is at once a celebration of youth while at the same time being melancholic and nostalgic. We're not writing from the teenage dance queen's point of view, we're watching her, we're observing her and appreciating her, reveling in her youth while wistfully recalling our own. But for these brief four minutes, we're transcended, we're there, with her, on the dance floor, feeling the beat from the tambourine and having the time of our life. And now it's the moment in the video you've all been waiting for, the memes. Here we go. So if you like the video, feel free to smash that like button with a sledgehammer. And if you like this deep dive concept, feel free to tell me in the comments. This is my very first deep dive video. And if you dig it, like you dig the Dancing Queen, let me know. Don't forget my album Synth Pop is Dead drops on Friday the 28th. Join my Patreon so you can be filled in on all of the updates and news as well as receiving free demos and songs. And I want to give a shout out to every single one of my Patreon supporters. I've been getting a few new Patreons recently and it's really a wonderful feeling. You guys are incredible. Thank you so much. Keep on trucking mother truckers.